Um, so for this afternoon deep dive, we have Siri Frost, Sarah Scott, and Oliver Grant from the Environment Agency, and Mungo Nash and Maria Hardy from Natural England, um, who will be running through some of the concerns around the watercourses tab that have been put forward by Basecamp in the last few months. Um, so over to you, Siri. Lovely. Thank you, Zane. Um, yeah, and thank you really for this opportunity. So we've we've got about 30 minutes um, where we're going to present to you drawing on some of the questions and issues that have been raised recently and to give you a sort of a broad understanding really of water courses. So, um, and I'll just introduce the team. So Zane's just briefly introduced us, but I'll just explain who we each are. Um, so I'm Siri Frost. I'm an advisor in the National Biodiversity Team at the Environment Agency. Um, we've got my colleague Sarah Scott, who's a senior advisor in the National Biodiversity Team at the Environment Agency um, and has been working on biodiversity net gain and the biodiversity metric for a number of years now. Um, we're joined by Oliver Grant, who's a geomorphological specialist um, who works in our national geomorphology team here at the Environment Agency. And then we're joined by our colleagues from Natural England, Mungo Nash, who's a senior advisor in the biodiversity metric team at Natural England, and Maria Hardy, who's currently a senior advisor in the BNG policy team at Natural England. I just thought it was useful just to explain some of the learning outcomes for today's session. So by the end of this session, um, we hope that you'll have gained a broader knowledge of water courses, um, that you'll have a better understanding of some of the more technical considerations of BNG and water courses, such as encroachment, um, that you'll have an understanding of the opportunities arising from the water courses part of the metric in the context of BNG and wider nature recovery. And obviously, you've had that opportunity to ask questions specific to BNG and water courses and, and to know where to find additional information and resources. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah now. Great. Thanks, Siri. Um, so, and thanks for the intro. Yeah, I'm Sarah Scott. I work for the Environment Agency. Uh, so, I first wanted to start off with, uh, so where does BNG fit with delivering some of the existing goals and drivers for water? So, as you can see, outcomes um, through BNG can be seen in the Environmental Improvement Plan, uh, the Integrated Plan for Water, and also through our own Environment Agency Flood Risk Strategies. Um, but the key area is really around the single physical modification. So 41% of all water bodies are affected by physical modification. So what is this? Uh, these are interventions that have physically changed the shape, uh, the flow regime, the natural processes that occur within a river and its floodplain, um, or to be blunt, uh, things that have materially uh, knackered uh, the river. So BNG can really help um, in reducing these existing modifications. Uh, they can mitigate new impacts and help ultimately to create healthy and resilient river systems. And then I think one of the key things that we wanted to do today was actually introduce you as well for those folk who haven't worked on rivers before to actually have a think about how rivers work uh, and what we really want the river system to be doing. So I'm really pleased that we've got our colleague um, Oliver Grant joining. So I'm going to hand over uh, to Oliver to talk a little bit around around rivers. Thanks, Sarah. I think I've got control. Um, so yeah, as, as uh, Siri and Sarah said, I work in the uh, National Geomorphology team here at the Environment Agency and our team were involved in the development of the river condition assessment which underpins sort of the biodiversity metric, uh, the biodiversity net gain watercourse metric um, and ensures a professional application of geomorphological and ecological understanding of how rivers function. Um, so what are the needs to know about rivers and what do we want people to take away? Uh, the first one is that we need to address the physical modifications, that top pressure that, that Sarah has just uh, just mentioned. And the second is that we need to manage the pressures at the source. And the third is that we want to restore natural processes. On the screen, you've got five morphology principles which underpin our soils to sea strategy. We'll go through those in turn and think about how biodiversity net gain can deliver on these principles for river restoration first of which is let nature do the work and this principle is about harnessing the power of our rivers and our catchments and our coasts uh, so they can really drive their own restoration 
where working with natural energy of rivers and coasts requires a less in intensive intervention. This can be through natural recovery, where we sort of step back and allow rivers uh, and coasts to recover without really intervening, or through assisted recovery, which is a series of measures that are designed to kickstart natural processes and facilitate that recovery. The next principle is think bigger. And this is about undertaking and linking up restoration actions across whole landscapes. Um, as healthy and resilient catchments are made up of lots of interconnected environments. We need to think about sediment, uh, vegetation, organic matter, which are all essential components of our aquatic environments. And um, we can deliver multiple benefits by taking action at a system scale and across a full range of environments. The next principle is reconnect. And this principle is about increasing our focus on restoring connectivity between environments, giving greater focus to restoring natural connectivity and then movement of water and sediment and water dependent organisms through our rivers and wetlands and really thinking about that source to sea journey. In this principle, we're really prioritising the removal of barriers within our environments, so weirs and dams uh, between environments such as embankments and walls and improving the connection to the to the floodplain, uh, to the hyperphoric zone, uh, which is the really important zone below the riverbed and to our groundwater. The next principle is give space and time. And this principle is about acknowledging that uh, natural recovery or assisted recovery takes time and um, we really need to give that space and time to allow the processes to create new physical habitat for vegetation to grow and for ecosystems to recover. Rivers and coasts require space to adapt and to, to changes in energy, sediment supply and biological influences and we want really resilient environments we need to give them the space to change and accommodate those natural fluctuations through time. If and final uh, of those morphology principles is plan and prioritise. And this principle encourages us to take uh, an increasingly planned and, and less opportunistic approach to river restoration and coastal restoration if we want to achieve catchment scale improvements and really build in climate resilience. We need to uh, be increasingly coordinated with our restoration effort across land and water. And this is a major hook here for biodiversity net gain. And we must place great em emphasis on planning to improve morphology, but, uh, just as we do with what we plan for um, the flow and water quality. This slide is just uh, those, those principles with a, a short description underneath, and this will be included in the slide plaque after today's presentation. So please do feel free to refer to it. Um, there is also a link to a National Geomorphology SharePoint page, although this might only be restricted to DEFRA employees. So otherwise feel free to contact me if you have any questions about how the National Geomorphology team fits in with the biodiversity net gain and the uh, watercourse metric. Uh, and I think I'm handing back to Sarah. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks, Oliver. Um, really inspiring uh, pictures there and images and definitely you know, I'm always inspired when I hear you talk especially just thinking about the reconnection that you get with rivers and their floodplains and linking in with the terrestrial habitats in the metrics so thank you for that um, so I wanted to just start here just starting right right at the beginning I suppose is when do we apply BNG for watercourses and simply I say simply, it's when the red line boundary enters the watercourse. So the key thing here is knowing what we mean by a watercourse or a river. So it is the channel, the banks, and this thing called the riparian zone. So a river isn't a pipe of water. The riparian zone is the area 10 metres back from the bank top that fundamentally influences the ecological function of the river 
this area is really critical to how the river functions. It inputs to the river organic matter, it's areas of erosion, uh, deposition, it's a wildlife corridor for species such as otters and bats, and it's really important as well for controlling heat, uh, so light and dark influences across the channel. So any development uh, that triggers or goes into that zone, uh, the watercourse module um, applies and impact doesn't matter. So even if the water course is just being retained, you need still need to apply a 10% uplift. So what I've been asked um, on these slides sometimes is, or people out in the field, it's actually well, where is the riparian zone? It's defined as the break of slope uh, between the channel and the bank sometimes can be quite difficult to see but my kind of rule of thumb is it's where you probably likely to build a shed that is absolutely not saying that I want sheds everywhere but it's just that kind of um, ability to think do you know what I'm not going to build a shed on the bank face I'm going to start building it particularly in this in this riparian area where it starts to flatten out other things that we've got in this uh, section is around the 10 metres. I, I think a lot of local authorities want to go further and actually want to have 20 metres. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Uh, this is a local uh, plan choice. Uh, wider buffer zones, you know, they create bigger ecosystem services. Um, the riparian zone also creates ecosystem services for pollution control, for flood risk management. So 20 metres is great. Um, but for net gain, we are looking at 10 metres. So it's 10 metres and also 10 metres comes into the river condition assessment, what uh, Mungo will talk about in a minute. So I just wanted to pause here um, because uh, what I have just said about when the watercourse um, metric applies is absolutely true. But I did think it's worth pausing here to make sure it's absolutely watertight, what I've just said. So when, let's go back, when does the watercourse metric apply? So let's go back simply, it's when the red line boundary enters the watercourse. Um, as noted above that this does include the riparian zone. And here I just want to put something else in and the planning permission is not exempt. OK, so that's quite key to understand. Um, the exemption has to be thought about in this situation. So the exemption here is the de minimis. So the de minimis exemption can apply to a watercourse if a development does not impact a priority river habitat and impacts less than five metres of an on-site linear habitat, so this being the watercourse, as well as less than 25 metres square uh, of an area habitat. So again, impact is defined as a reduction in the biodiversity value as calculated by the metric. And so for, for here for water courses, it would be condition or encroachment that's being the, uh, the impact. Um, so where might actually de minimis apply? So um, an example here might be a development where there's a, a water course um, in a culvert uh, and it's running underneath a car park. Uh, where the intention is to build some, I don't know, new utility buildings. Uh, so the terrestrial baseline is zero. So in this uh, scenario, we uh, would be able to apply de minimis because there is no impact to the water course. OK. And that's right. So even I was just worth flagging. So even if de minimis applies and BNG isn't required, if there is an impact to a watercourse, there are other protections and permission for works in and around rivers that would still apply. So obviously BNG still forms one of those, you know, parts of the jigsaw that we have to understand. So we also just wanted to just touch on here about um, intertidal. Um, how does intertidal and watercourses fit together? Um, and so estuaries um, are not included in the watercourse module. Uh, they're not a specific watercourse type. And this is because they are subtidal. Um, so this means that they have the bit that's permanently wet uh, and they fall beyond the scope of town and country planning law. That means that it exceeds beyond the low water level. 
So in the estuary, I mean, what we're really looking at is the presence of the intertidal habitats. So these are the habitats that operate between mean high and mean low water level. So these are things like um, intertidal muds um, and salt marsh, etc. So the other thing we have to understand here then is if estuaries don't apply for in the watercourse module, when does the estuary start and when does the watercourse start? So we have to understand that. Uh, so defining where a river ends and an estuary begins, I must admit it has been a, a really tra challenging process um, as the, es the interface between the river and the estuarine is a really dynamic area. Um, and we needed a system that was kind of readily accessible to practitioners uh, without being ambiguous or overly complex. Um, and as such, we've used a water framework directive data layer uh, for it's called transitional and coastal water bodies and so in that top image um, with the blue squiggly line on it that's the river Thames so that's the Thames estuary and as you can see the estuary is vast um, and it's mapped from Teddington Lock all the way down to the estuary so that's, that's you're looking at over about 60 miles which is about you know uh, that's not scoped into the watercourses part and in this zone you really are just looking at the intertidal habitats but what we've got in the second image below with the dotted lines and there's lots of information there that you'll be able to look at when you get the slide pack uh, was we can see that the estuary is often split into upper middle and lower estuary um, and it's in the upper area where you get this zone of exchange between kind of fluvial and tidal, um, where sometimes there's very few intertidal habitats present. Uh, and actually the estuary exhibits, exhibits riverine features. Um, so it's a bit of a it's a bit of a grey area where really net gain uh, isn't working, isn't working particularly well. So that's where uh, we've put in the, the user guide that here you can apply the water course uh, part of the metric um, if it is exhibiting riverine features. But again, going to local authority to have that conversation um, in the first place. So this is another area that many people have um, kind of raised a, as an area that needs a little bit more sort of clarification. And it's it's around whether a, a river is a, a watercourse is a, a, a river um, or it's a ditch. And I've been working on um, rivers for 20 years and, and I thought this was absolutely obvious. Of course it's obvious if you're working on a river or a ditch and it really isn't. So uh, classifying whether a watercourse is a river or a ditch is not always straightforward and definitely looks here are deceiving. So straight physically modified channels are often being put as ditches. Uh, many small temporary watercourses um, you know, chalk rivers um, high up are actually headwaters, uh, a part of the natural flow path of many rivers, and they are being misclassified as ditches. On the other hand, alternatively, you've got these large flood flow drains, uh, and sometimes they're called sewers, and they're being categorised as ditches. Um, so the classification in, in the metric, um, it's a little bit of a hybrid of the UK HAB uh, classification um, and it, it talks about the width of the river, it talks about being wet for four months. Um, basically what we're saying is that I think there's other things that we can do to actually help people in that kind of uh, decision making to know whether it is a, a river stream or ditch uh, and particularly around this, particularly around uh, the hydraulic drainage function. So is it working kind of on a, a field level? So is it uh, just for land drainage? Or actually, is this river part of the catchment? If it is it working as part of the big catchment flow path? Or also the landscape context, is it actually this, this watercourse? Is it sitting in the valley floor? Or is it actually, is it just been put in there for land use? Um, Things like presence, natural, modified, excavated can also help, but it's that thing about looks being deceiving. So I think two of the key areas of this kind of hydraulic function and also its landscape context can really help pinpoint whether it's a river stream or it's a ditch. So we're just working on some of that 
uh, understanding with some some um, experts uh, and other wider stakeholders. And when we've got that information, we will be able to share it um, as well. So I'm going to hand over now uh, to Mungo. He's going to take us through a bit more about the metric in detail. Thanks, Mungo. Hello. Um, so yeah, I work for Natural England. I've kind of been involved with the development of the metric since uh, 2021. Um, I'm going to talk through some of the components of the water course uh, unit module. Uh, so hopefully a lot of these things in these orange bubbles uh, will be familiar to you. We have distinctiveness, which is determined by the water course type. Um, we have condition, uh, strategic significance, um, all found at baseline uh, encroachment, which I'm going to talk about in a little more detail a bit later. And then we also have these um, outside of the, the dashed lines. We have things that are found at post intervention, things like spatial risk. Uh, difficulty of enhancement or creation and time to target condition. So these kind of uh, represent some of the risks uh, involved around habitat creation and delivery. Um, so I, I think in terms of watercourse module, the two multipliers that I really want to flag and zoom in on are the encroachment um, multipliers. Uh, this is because they kind of provide a good incentive for those setback and nature based solutions that Oliver was talking about. Um, and also sometimes development and developers can have very subtle impacts on rivers uh, and the repairing corridor that might not necessarily be picked up um, in a broad scale uh, condition assessment. So, so encroachment, um, watercourse and riparian are there to kind of pick up on those on those things that aren't necessarily picked up in the watercourse condition assessment. Um, so for an example, repairing encroachment broadly concerns about how close the developer encroaches up into the channel, whereas watercourse would be things like uh, weirs and hard hard structures within the watercourse itself. Um, so if we zoom in a bit on encroachment and, ooh, oh, here we go, there's a bit more information. I didn't realise these were animated. So yeah, we have distinctiveness based on watercourse types. We've got conditions, so we can see that a condition assessment is needed uh, for priority rivers, other other rivers and canals. I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. And then there's also a specific ditch condition assessment for ditches and no condition assessment needed for culverts. Um, strategic significance, which is, is kind of set by local nature recovery strategies or catchment action plans. And then we have um, our encroachment and watercourse um, watercourse and riparian encroachment, which I'm going to zoom in on now and talk about riparian encroachment. So riparian encroachment is effectively any feature or intervention within the riparian zone that reduces the, the quantity or quality of ecological function of the riparian habitat. So all those things that Sarah was talking about, um, the benefits of the riparian zone, it would be anything that would impact that. So that would be buildings, hard standing. It could be management practices um, such as agricultural pressures on the riparian zone or, or structures that prevent wildlife from accessing the riverbank, such as fences. Um, and you can see here uh, that there are different bands for encroachment and uh, an assessor would look at encroachment on both the right hand bank and the left hand bank um, and they would look at the percentage um, or extent of these features and how close they how closely they encroach um, to the to the watercourse uh, the extent of that encroachment so there are there are different bands um, it's no encroachment minor moderate and major and there are different thresholds at which those are uh, those are triggered um, and then that would be entered into the metric uh, and you would be penalized for the extent of, you know, for larger major encroachment, whereas a minor encroachment wouldn't have such a heavy penalization in terms of your unit outputs. Um, there are some exceptions, uh, things that shouldn't be uh, considered encroachment. So, uh, and these are typically where, where features are found in the baseline. This could be established canal or river navigation towpaths established footpaths and existing river crossings uh, and existing small amenity features. Um, so if those if those are found in the baseline, uh, you wouldn't necessarily record them uh, as encroachment. Um, then there's also watercourse encroachment. 
uh, and these are these are things uh, like weirs um, it can, and they're features which adversely affect the natural function of the watercourse or results in localised changes to habitat species and migration pathways. So things that would stop uh, fish, for example, uh, migrating up the river. Um, again, there are some exemptions about, you know, when oh, I've not gone to the next slide. Sorry. There we go. Watercourse encroachment. There we go. Um, there are exemptions. Again, uh, we have um, things that are introduced to restore the condition of a river. Um, for example, a woody beaver dam uh, or soft back bank revetment, uh, such as core, a queer or a willow spiling or floating islands. These things um, are not considered to be watercourse encroachment. Um, and the metric applies a watercourse encroachment multiplier, which accounts for any development within a river bank or channel that impacts the function of the river corridor. And again, there are several bands um, of encroachment. Uh, and uh, there's a specific one for culverts, uh, which is set at, at quite high at, um, at 0.68, which obviously would reduce the amount of units you would be generating through your metric. Um, I think when we're talking about rivers, um, it's important to tell a story about the river as a whole, um, because I think rivers tell very good stories and if you're assessing uh, a river as one section one section of a, of a river in the metric you're not picking up on all the things that are kind of happening in that river so we're aiming to see metrics where you can see each each section of the river as a separate line and these these sections um, and this image here is a an excerpt from the user guide and you can see that we have a length of river that has been split into separate sections of of condition distinctiveness you have the culverted section um, and and condition so you have uh, section three and four which vary in condition and 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 these separate lines in the metric can tell different stories about what's happening in your site and they can be used at post intervention also to kind of inform what's what's happening where it's happening and how that river is being impacted by what you're doing um, so one of the ways you can uh, you can enhance the river is obviously condition um, and there are statutory condition conditioner sheets uh, for area habitats within the metric but for the water courses um, we're asking that people are river condition assessment professionally accredited um, so you need to be accredited to do a river condition assessment for water courses. It's very much a, a record what you see um, as you're walking the site. It's meant to be uh, features that are very easily um, monitored uh, and and pick up on all those geomorphological features that Oliver was talking about. Um, there is a data platform um, where this information can be input. Uh, and there's a standardised reporting form um, which is provided to those taking the RCA training and there's also one in Natural England's Habitat Monitoring Management Plan template. Um, when, you're, when you're reviewing uh, a condition assessment, um, I think it's, it's very important that this information is given to you in a way that can be understood because as, as reviewers, you're not expected to have undergone um, the training yourself, but uh, you need to kind of understand what is happening, what you know, what what's happening on that river. So the watercourse assessments for priority river habitat, other rivers and streams and canals have a, a condition output that's auto generated from an information system, an example being cartographer, but there are also um, other built RCA output tools to be used. And the condition class is calculated by combining pre-calculated averages of weighted positive and negative riverine habitat indicators. So these are habitat indicators such as the bank top vegetation structure and the bank top tree feature rich, richness. So you, in this example here, we can see that uh, indice B2, which talks about bank top tree feature richness, has a is, is shown as red, so it has a negative, uh, negative influence on the condition of that 
um, water course. And at post intervention, um, you'd expect to see uh, uh, you'd expect to see actions which would result in removal of those negative in indicators if they were feasible. So, um, what information can you see as a local planning authority? You should be able to see a river condition reporting sheet, the habitat and monitoring management and monitoring plan, which will kind of set out uh, how those how those net gains will be achieved. Um, and the RCA data downloads of condition indicators, um, which could be uh, just the negative indicators, which could be addressed, um, but also the positive ones that are contributing positively towards the condition of that water course. Um, and and you can request those points uh, if if not found as part of the submission. So you you should be asking for your river condition reporting sheet. Uh, and also that RCA data download of condition indicators, uh, preferably in a way in which you'll be able to understand what is um, causing the negative, um, the negative impact on condition and also the, the positive impacts. Um, so apart from condition, how else can we achieve an uplift in the metric? So uh, the metric, kind of looks at uplift in terms of um, primarily enhancement, which is anything which promotes natural function, uh, processes and development of natural habitats. So this could be things like removing culverts, uh, enhancing the riparian zone, removing encroachment features, uh, restoring natural tidal processes or watercourse alignments. Um, so uh, I think you know, those are, those are all very powerful ways in which, um, you know, the metric can take what's happening on site and translate it into a biodiversity net gain. Um, creation in terms of water courses is, is generally seen as a more negative thing. It's where interventions do not promote natural functions and processes. Um, so that could be installing a culvert uh, uh, or channel straightening. And typically in, that, in the metric that would be recorded as a, a habitat loss and then a recreation in a lower condition state. And that's when all those multipliers in terms of risk start to kind of embed and um, influence um, the post-development biodiversity units. Um, and generally uh, those would result in a decreasing in biodiversity units. So that's decreases in condition length would be a loss. Um, there is a, 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 a what would you call it? Um, there's an exemption to this, which is new canals and ditches are creation, and they are they're, they're gen, genuine creation of a new water course. Um, so they can be input into the metric um, as as a creation input without associated loss. Um, I'm going to hand over to Siri now, who's going to talk to you about um, a checklist. Thank you, Mungo. Um, yeah, so the next couple of slides are really going to look at some of the resources, some of the training and information that are available to you. I think we're incredibly conscious that this is a, a big topic in its own right um, and that we're all um, getting up to speed with it. Um, and so, you know, having access to that information um, is really important. One of the first things I wanted to point out was this uh, checklist training um, that we delivered um, in collaboration with the Planning Advisory Service um, in spring 2023. So it's about 18 months old now, um, but with the idea that there was um, a, a checklist to support anybody reviewing um, a BNG and water courses submission. Um, that, that training provision is still available on the PAS website, um, but we are intending to review it and update it to make sure it reflects the latest guidance. Um, having said that, the, the principles and content of that training is still very relevant, so that, that resource does remain available to you and, and obviously we'll, we'll um, advise you once that, that reviewed, that revised training is available. Um, this slide has got some links in it to you. So obviously when we share the slide pack, um, do, do go to this slide and follow some of the links. Um, it was really just to make you aware of an increasing amount of training, good quality training that's available to you in the industry. Um, some of them to point out in particular are, so we've got some training with the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management or SIEM. Um, they've got a, a broad um, range of BNG courses um, and an increasing range of water courses and BNG focused courses. So really worthwhile exploring those. Um, I've provided a link there to the accredited training with Cartographer. 
and the river condition assessment and then hopefully you'll all be very well aware of the the resource that's available to you through the planning advisory service there's a real wealth of information links and, and sessions available to you there more broadly um, some of the resources i wanted to point out were things like the catchment based approach or cabba which is all about um, collaborative partnership working um, and contains a lot of information resources and, and we'll start to pinpoint into the areas that your geography that you're working in and, and explore the partnerships that exist there. Um, the River Wiki case studies uh, as a, an interaction interactive collection of resources that are available to you that look at river restoration um, and bring a whole host of case studies from right across Europe. And you've got the River Restoration Centre that uh, provides um, expertise around best practice and river restoration habitat enhancement and has a, uh, also supports um, a range of training um, and has an annual conference of which um, Watercourses and BNG was one of the features last year and will be for the coming uh, conference next year. And then I wanted to point out the British Society for Geomorphology, um, which is the professional body for geomorphologists. And particularly on this subject, as we increasingly see that collaboration between ecologists and geomorphologists, as being aware of the other professions and, and accessing um, that expertise and advice. We're also looking at communities of practice. So at the moment, there's an informal um, Facebook a group that was set up by practitioners as a, as a forum, really, to share ex um, sort of questions, advice um, as we're learning um, how we deliver BNG. But in the longer run, we're looking at developing a, a sort of more formal community of practice um, through which we can collaborate and share, share expertise. Um, and there's a slide here, I won't run through it, but again, it's got a range of links that you can revisit, look at, as, as particularly for those that aren't familiar with working with watercourses, can feel more confident with the subject and, and explore the subject further. And I'm going to hand back to Sarah just to, to provide some closing slides. Yeah, thanks, Siri. Um, I just thought it would be worth to kind of put into uh, context. What you, we're obviously doing training um, across the board, across the piece. So what do we tell ecologists? Um, again, it just goes back to those principles that Oliver started uh, talking about at the start, you know, catchment thinking, that we're not just hopefully putting this bit of restoration uh, just at site, we're actually thinking at how it's working within the catchment itself. The other thing we're saying is there's a lot of guidance out there that, you know, that Siri's just mentioned about how rivers work um, and what we're trying to achieve, but also the guidance, the user guide, um, just really getting getting to know that, taking it out on site uh, with you, getting to understand the differences with the encroachment plans. There's a lot of good information in the guidance itself. And as Mungo said, let the river tell the story. Um, I think that's just key, you know, walk the site, get to know it, get to see what's different, get to see what's similar uh, and being able to then put that into the metric. And, and the other thing is, you know, think about when to ask for help, where the community of practice is hopefully going to really come into play, um, but maybe when to seek the advice of a, of a geomorphologist um, or, or an engineer, perhaps. Uh, so just thinking about that tipping point. Um, but also just to, what we're also saying to, to ecologists is that the watercourses are complex. Um, so although there's the BNG element, <coughs> excuse me, with the watercourse, oh, <coughs> I'm going to cough here. Obviously, there's the BNG um, module forecast, but really before it gets to that detailed design, it has to have gone into this big thought cloud here that's going to have interaction with a whole heap of, of people about you know really trying to think about what goes into that detailed design your catchment partnerships maybe the geomorphologists the river engineers your flood modelers and hydrologists permitting from the environment agency so um i think it's just giving that comfort to to the ecologist having to think about what what makes things good for net gain? It's actually just putting that get that thing about net gain into this bigger jigsaw of what we're really doing um, for rivers and all of the things that we need to be thinking about before we start works on a river. And I'll just end here again with that kind of storytelling. Um, I think it's what we've already already gone through, but it's really letting that that river tell the story and then being able to put that into the metric. So, for example, um, 
this was a site um, in St Albans and you know the first little bubble that we had we had a weir there and that was having a, a length of, of water course that was being uh, backed up it had a very different kind of morphology to it then we had this bridge section then we had the, the third bubble going down now that had quite a lot of hard revetment on the banks it had a lot of different encroachment going on so actually that bit was a different section and then the bit further down was actually again a different condition different encroachment so we had those four different sections and this is how we were telling the story of what was going on in that river so i think that brings our slides to an end so i think we can probably um, close our slides now and i think i'll pass back to zane and open it up for for questions but thank you to all of our uh, presenters um today thank you